Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening for our pediatric webinar series. Uh, my name is Dr. Elaine Schulte. I'm the Vice Chair of Academic Affairs and Faculty Development at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Dr. Alexis Richards is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Montefiore Einstein and the Medical Director of the Eating Disorder Program at Montefiore. Her clinical focus centers on eating disorders, adolescent mental health, gender affirming care, adolescent gynecology, and reproductive health services. After obtaining her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from NYU in 2007, Dr. Richards earned her Master of Science in the Control of Infectious Diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London, UK in 2011. She then moved back to the United States to continue her medical training, completing her post-baccalaureate pre-medical science certificate at Columbia University in 2012, and her Doctor of Medicine at Emory University in 2015. Dr. Richards completed her pediatrics internship and residency at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center in 2018, and a clinical fellowship in adolescent medicine at the University of California, San Francisco in 2023. Alicia Hoffman, LCSW, is the program coordinator of the eating disorder program at Montefiore. She was part of the team to develop the program in December of 2016. She received her undergraduate degree in community and family services from the University of Delaware and her master's in social work from Fordham University. Alicia has completed training in FBT and adolescent focused therapy from the Training Institute for Child and Adolescent Eating Disorders. Welcome both. And Laura is yours. Great. So thank you all for having me, um, particularly here to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, if you were at the ground rounds this morning, there will be some crossover, but the purpose of my talk, the objective is really to focus on how we can identify and treat in a general pediatric office and, and what the next steps are going to be. So firstly, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, I do have a different disclosure, which is I have two very rambunctious cats that were excited that I'm home. So if you hear noises or jumping around, I, I apologize for that. Okay, so the objectives of the talk today are, are first really to give an introduction to eating disorders and, and why we worried about them and why we uh, really wanna kind of help spread the education of how to take care of these patients. Along those lines, uh, I really want to help figure out how to recognize the warning signs of disordered eating in, in pediatrics and adolescent patients, and then how to go on and do that initial evaluation um, of those patients that are presenting with disordered eating in that general pediatric clinic. And then I'm going to lastly talk really about the pillars of the treatment process and provide some resources to you guys to be able to, to A, use yourself and B, provide to your families um, and patients that are struggling. So why am I here talking about this today? Well, in order to answer that question, I'm gonna first do sort of a brief introduction to eating disorders and eating disorder care. So what are eating disorders? We know that they're really a dis severe disturbance in attitudes and behaviors around eating, weight, shape, body image, and they can affect anyone. And I mean anyone, any age, any gender, any sex, any geographical location, um, anyone can have an eating disorder that's going to affect their life. You know, previously we'd really thought about it in terms of higher SES cisgender females, um, and our understanding of that has changed greatly. And that has also influenced our approach to not just the evaluation, but also in our treatment. When we think about etiology, and I get this question a lot from, from the parents of my patients, like how did this happen? How did this develop? We really have an understanding that A, every patient is different and has a different contributing factors that lead to them. So we see this large range, biological, psychological, social factors that all contribute, right? We know there's a high genetic load. We also know that diet and dieting culture and that reduction of calories can often trigger eating disorders to develop. Comorbid medical conditions have also seen to have an association, for example, type 1 diabetes. There are many psychological factors, history of anxiety disorders in particular, some rigidity, um, this perfectionism, these high achieving kids, right, that are striving for A's and everything they do. 
Um, there's a correlation with gender dysphoria and also with this body dysmorphia and dissatisfaction. And then in terms of social, social factors, again, I think this list is almost endless, but we do see a high amount of, um, of correlation with patients that have been bullied and bullied particularly around their weight, the weight stigma that, it, that the world is, is really facing today, and then social isolation. And, and some of that may be contributing to some of the incidents and, and sort of rise in eating disorders that we saw during COVID. And then this ideal body perception that I referred to earlier. So why are we worried, right? As I just mentioned, we saw this increasing incidence during the COVID pandemic, I think across the board, not just in adolescents, but in general pediatrics, the number of patients that we were seeing that were having you know, significant weight loss or significant eating disorder cognitions and behaviors really skyrocketed. Um, and the impact that that was having on general pediatric practices and adolescent medicine and psychology and psychiatry just led to what was already an under-resourced area of care really being strained to the brink. Um, there are high rates of you know, variation of medical complications, and I'm going to go into those in a lot more detail. What I will say as just sort of a, a, uh, an introduction to that is malnutrition can cause essentially all organ systems to be infected, and therefore medical complications are almost endless. There are incredibly high mortality rates. So anorexia nervosa in particular has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. It's around 10%. Um, and tied to that, right, in, in the patients that um, unfortunately don't survive their illness, about 20% of those patients actually um, um, die by suicide. So there's huge amounts of morbidity and mortality that result um, from eating disorders. And those that, that do survive, there is this portion that end up going on to having severe and enduring illness. And that severe and enduring illness just has incredible impacts psychologically, physiologically, socially, emotionally um, that go on. And part of that is that there can be delays in appropriate treatment and some of the consequences of eating disorders are, are not reversed. PCPs play an essential role. This is so important, right? Adolescents and young adulthood are vulnerable periods for the development of eating disorders. And patients are often coming to their PCP with either complaints that are the sequelae of their eating disorder or their parents or themselves are, are worried that there's something going on here. So they may be presenting to their general pediatricians with a physical complaint that ends up being related to the eating disorder and the malnutrition that they're suffering as a result of that. And the same goes with psychiatric complaints. Um, we, what we do know and what I'm gonna stress is early intervention improves prognosis and chance for recovery. And again, we'll go later. And, and if you were at um, Dr. Peoples lecture, you know, full recovery is absolutely possible. And we're lucky in the, in the pediatric and adolescent world that we get to see that quite often. So what are the different types of eating disorders? And the caveat to this next kind of section of the talk is that the DSM-5 has these kind of strict guidelines. Some of that is changing as we're learning more about it. And ultimately, when we're thinking about the medical treatment, it's really the behaviors that lead to the, to the malnutrition and eating disorder that we care about. And also eating disorder diagnoses often change over time as behaviors change. So let me start with anorexia nervosa and I'm gonna label this the typical anorexia nervosa and we'll talk about atypical a little bit later. But the DSM-5 um, criteria really uh, comes down to a restriction of energy intake that leads to a significantly low body weight in the context of age, sex, developmental trajectory and physical health. There's an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat or the use of behaviors to prevent weight gain. There's a disturbance in the way one's body shape or weight is experienced or a persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of that current low body weight. And within anorexia, there's really two main subtypes, the binge purge subtype 
subtype that has um, a cycle of binging and purging um, behaviors or the restrictive subtype, uh, subtype which is really mostly um, focused on uh, calorie restriction. The big changes from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 are important because um, one of the things that they eliminated was the need for amenorrhea in order to diagnose anorexia. And if you require amenorrhea for a diagnosis of anorexia, you are limiting your patient population with this diagnosis to um, uh, assigned females at birth that have the ability to, to um, have their period and menarche. And what we know now is that there's really a large population um, of patients with anorexia nervosa who are assigned male at birth. Next, um, there's bulimia nervosa. And bulimia nervosa is really um, diagnosed by recurrent episodes of binge eating, eating a larger amount of food um, that most um, would eat, uh, sorry, eating a larger amount of food than most would in a discrete period of time, um, as well as a lack of control during this, these episodes. And with that comes the recurrent compensatory behaviors to prevent weight gain. So this can be self-induced vomiting, the use of laxatives, diuretics, other medications, um, in addition to fasting and or excessive exercise. These binge and purge behaviors must occur at least once a week for three months on average, right? So it could be that you have a month where you only have one episode, you know, but in other months you're having more frequent episodes. So it averages out really to be once for three months. And that self-evaluation is really unduly influenced by body weight and shape. Now, sometimes, you know, it's confusing. Is this anorexia binge purge or is this bulimia nervosa? And the distinguishing part between the two of those um, is really that uh, in anorexia nervosa, particularly typical, is either very, very, very low um, for what we expect, or that there's been a significant loss of weight regardless of what those starting and ending numbers are. ARFID, which is one of my favorite um, diagnoses to talk about is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And this is really characterized by a persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional or energy needs with one or more of the following. So, there can be a significant weight loss or failure to achieve expected weight gain or growth. So you see that toe along the growth curve, significant nutritional deficiencies. And I'm gonna talk about the nutritional deficiencies we see in restrictive eating disorders, as well as this um, dependence on enteral feeds or oral nutritional supplements. And by that, I mean things like Boost or Ensure in order to, to get their nutrition. And then this marked interference with social functioning. ARFID cannot be explained by food insecurity or cultural practice. It does not occur with a disturbance in the way body weight or shape is experienced. It's not attributable to any other medical condition or mental health diagnosis. And these patients often have these rigid food ideas and narrow range picky eating. Um, for example, I had one patient who only ate chicken nuggets and we had to work with him only eating chicken nuggets in order to be able to really um, increase the, the calories that he needed in order to thrive. OSFED or otherwise specified eating and feeding disorder was previously known as EDNOS, so this eating disorder not otherwise specified. And it's really this sort of umbrella diagnosis for some of the other um, eating disorders that we, we see. And one of those actually is atypical anorexia, but also there's low frequency or limited duration bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder. There's night eating disorder, purging disorder. Um, I've highlighted atypical anorexia nervosa here because um, what we know about atypical anorexia and, the, and how it's distinguished from typical is really the, the weight thresholds, right? So they have the, the same diagnostic criteria. Um, however, really it's the, it's the, um, the starting and ending weight, right? And so patients with atypical anorexia have this higher than normal or normal range. Um, BMIs despite the weight loss and with typical, we really see that lower, that lower weight. Um, and again, we're gonna touch a little bit more on that. Finally, binge eating disorder. Um, binge eating disorder is actually the most common eating disorder that's diagnosed in, in patients that are presenting for care. 
and it's characterized by recurrent episodes of binge eating associated with three of them more, um, either eating more rapidly than others, eating until uncomfortably full and past that, eating large amounts even when not hungry. Patients often eat alone due, due to the shame of how much they're eating quickly and then also accompanied with feelings of disgust, depression, guilt after the episodes of binge eating. Must cause marked distress. Uh, and again, it has this, um, this timeline and amount that so must occur at least once a week for three months. And again, it's on average. And binge eating disorder, separate from bulimia, really does not have a compensatory behavior that's associated with it. Okay, so how do we recognize the warning signs? Um, again, I mentioned earlier, the pediatricians are often first pass for these patients that are presenting for care. And we really wanna be able to quickly and efficiently diagnose as well as evaluate patients that may be suffering from um, eating disorders, particularly because of the high morbidity and mortality rates um, that we saw. And also, as I mentioned, early intervention and treatment can lead to full recovery. So it's really, the way I think about it is a combination of physical signs and subjective complaints that um, patients present with that you can kind of tie together and see how they, how they fit into the picture. Most importantly, however, all instances of precipitous weight loss or gain in an otherwise healthy patient should be investigated as a potential eating disorder. And in children and adolescents, a plateau in weight or height, ga uh, height gains and or delays in pubertal development should be investigated as a potential eating disorder. I'm gonna say this again because it's so important. All instances of precipitous weight loss or gain in an otherwise healthy patient should be investigated as a potential eating disorder. And in children and adolescents, a plateau in weight or height gains and delays in puberty development should be investigated as a potential eating disorder. While we're investigating these as potential eating disorders, we're also conducting a thorough medical investigation. And I'm gonna review some of the labs that I do when I'm seeing patients for the first time to really help me figure out, is there a medical thing that's going on while I'm recommending treatment for the eating disorder and the malnutrition? These things can be done together. Okay, this is just quickly looking at some growth curves that, um, that are patients of ours. And the, the first one is that more typical, a, more typical, atypical, looks more like an atypical growth chart. So you see this patient who, whose BMI was, um, or this is their weight, was living up in that 97th percentile, some variability going back and forth. And then suddenly, you know, we see this turning point around 19 years old where we have this steep drop off, right? this cliff-like drop-off. Um, and as you see those, um, those cluster of, of um, points right around that 50th percentile, that's when he started presenting for care with his pediatrician. And so it's being seen more for really close follow-up. And next, this is another patient um, in our program who is more in the typical criteria. So you see that, that she was kind of hugging that 25th percentile and then had this drop off um, and has been kind of wavering now along that third percentile. So these are the kind of trends that I recommend everybody look out for. Okay, so how do we figure out if an eating disorder is possible? So there's a validated screening that I really wanted to highlight here. Um, the scoff and uh, it was, it was, kind of validated and created in, um, in Britain, which is why um, the third point uh, has stone as a measurement. So um, the, the SCOF just stands for the, the kind of the five different questions to remember. So those questions are, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry that you've lost control over how much you eat? Have you recently lost more than one stone, which is 14 pounds in a three month period? Do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you are too thin? And would you say food dominates your life? And a score of two or more is really suspicious that um, perhaps an eating disorder could be going on. Um, and the reason that I highlighted this validated screening, because there's lots out there um, that are used 
and have good results is because what we found recently um, is that in the in the food insecure population of which they are high risk for the development of eating disorders and in our population in particular there's higher rates of food insecurity the scoff is actually better at picking up eating disorder um, behaviors cognitions risks um, than some of the other uh, screenings although they have yet to kind of be tested more thoroughly so stay tuned but we know that the scoff um, is able to pick up eating disorder behaviors and cognitions in patients in food insecure populations i wanted to have a quick slide about obesity management and eating disorders because i think it's impossible not to talk about it from an eating disorder perspective um, there are new guidelines on obesity management that were released by the AAP urging clinicians to really treat childhood obesity more aggressively and at younger ages. And most of it focuses really on changing BMI and weight rather than looking at the health of the patient um, in general. The reason why the eating disorder is particularly nervous and worried about the guidelines is we are seeing a number of patients of higher weight with eating disorders um, develop as a result of um, being told that they're in too large of a body and being told that they need to lose weight um, in order to, to be healthy and it gets out of control really quickly. As I mentioned, right, diet and diet culture is actually a trigger. Calorie restriction is a trigger for the development and eating disorders in patients that, um, that are already at risk. So, what we're seeing is adolescents admitted to the hospital um, with this greater amount, this rate and duration of weight loss actually had clinical statuses that were worse regardless of their admission weight. So you can have somebody who's still admitted, you know, at the 85th percentile, but the amount of weight they lost just puts them at such more incredible risk of instability and death um, than somebody who perhaps is, at a, is admitted at a lower weight, but had less um, of that high amount of weight loss. So what I urge you to do, what I beg you to do is really, um, if you are recommending weight loss um, for medical sequelae of obesity and not just obesity alone, they should have very close follow-up to monitor um, as well as frequent reevaluation re of disordered eating, right? So you wanna see these patients closely. You wanna make sure that that velocity of weight loss is not high, is not picking up and asking the questions, right? How are you feeling about this? What is your body image? Do you have a goal weight? All of these things and make sure that they're eating regularly frequently. So that's my, that's my one plug. Okay, so let's move in a little bit and talk about the initial evaluation of patients with disordered eating. Um, they present to your office for a number of different reasons. What are you gonna do? So the first is really, really good gathering history, right? So highlight this again, look at all your growth charts. Is there something that, that we need to act urgently, emergently while we're getting our history? You know, is there something that you should be concerned about? Right? We expect normal variation, normal fluctuations, but really those precipitous drop-offs. And then ask questions, right? I think it's really can be nerve wracking to talk about these things with patients. Um, and my advice is really just go in there, like ask, when did the weight loss start occurring? Um, how is this happening? What's, yeah, have you had changes of habits? What are your goals, right? All right how many meals are you eating? What's the portion size? Um, are there new restrictions in the types of food that you're having, right? Is this a new vegetarian or a new vegan? Um, are they suddenly not eating carbs or sweets when that used to be their favorite thing? Have they stopped eating dinner with the family and really are eating alone? is there this focus on healthy eating, right? This um, ice cream is unhealthy, but fruit is good. So I'm gonna eat fruit salad for dinner instead. Uh, is there an increase in exercise? Are they suddenly you know, thinking about a new sport when they never were before? Are there frequent trips to the bathroom or long periods of time that they're spending in the bathroom, particularly after meals? Are they suddenly wearing baggier clothing? And then thinking about their reproductive and sexual health. And so, you know, with, with um, patients that are assigned female at birth, we're really good at asking their menstrual history. When did you go through menarche? When was your last period? Are they regular? Are they irregular? 
Um, but with, uh, I think, patients that are assigned male at birth, we're, we're not as used to it, right? It's not something that we're monitoring as much. And one question you can ask, are you getting morning erections still? Because that can be a sign that um, that the, the, the HPG access has been affected by the malnutrition. And then super important to ask family history and not just family history of, of eating disorders, but family history of any other psychiatric illness in addition to other medical problems. And that's gonna help kind of shape how you think about it. Um, I also always have these conversations and ask these questions with both the patient and the parent in the room, because what I found is I will ask these questions and they will both have different answers in, in patients that um, end up having being diagnosed with eating disorders. And so asking them both at the same time and saying, hey, it's okay if you don't agree, but I like to know all the information. Um, and then I meet with the patient separately and I see, is there anything else that you wanna share? Do you have thoughts? And I meet with the parent separately as well. Okay, so I talked about all these changes in habits. So what are our eating disorder behaviors? and compensatory behaviors. So what we see and what I like to ask about during all of my follow-ups and including my initial intakes are, you know, is there any self-induced vomiting? Um, uh, is there laxative use, diuretic use, diet pill use? Are there any other medications that you have access to or that are using, for example, insulin? What are your exercise habits like? Um, you know, what are you doing? Are you that sometimes I'll hear like, oh, I, I don't work out. And the parent will say, well, they don't work out, but they're standing all the time or they're pacing or marching in place, right? What are your, what's your fluid intake like? Is there a restriction? Is there overload? Is there any rumination? Is there chewing and spitting? Is there food hiding? Um, and is there overuse of caffeine or other stimulants like nicotine? And some of these behaviors are, you know, they're, they're very sort of um, part of the eating disorder itself. Um, and some of them are some are, are sometimes used to manipulate um, vital signs or weight or things like that. Um, for example, fluid overload, and we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so I mentioned earlier, they might come to you for a physical complaint and not be worried about the weight at all. And it's often through these physical complaints, once we look at the growth chart that we can start to figure out that perhaps there's something else that's going on here that we need to address. So the, the most common physical complaints that I see are fatigue and fatigue's a hard one because I feel like everybody is fatigued right now. We're all tired, um, but it's not particularly common for a 16 year old to be fatigued if they're getting enough sleep, you know, if they're not staying up till three in the morning doing their homework. So fatigue, um, cold intolerance, right? So the way I ask about that is, are you, you know, do you find yourself wearing more clothes because you're cold when other people aren't, right? Is, is your sister wearing a t-shirt and you're in your winter jacket at home? Has there been hair loss or changes to hair texture, more brittle um, and feels like the volume is getting less? GI complaints are a huge one for us. So nausea, early satiety, bloating, reflux, constipation, um, changes in the reproductive. So suddenly, you know, have you lost your period or is it becoming more, more, um, more irregular? Is it, you know, lightning in, in days and in flow? Is there dizziness, lightheadedness? And, and this can lead to presyncope or syncope. Are you having heart palpitations, particularly when you stand up? Are there mood changes? Do you feel like you're more anxious, more irritable? Is there more sadness, more anhedonia? And then this brain fog, right? Is a lot of these patients who are focused on school are suddenly not able to complete the tasks that normally didn't cause them any problems. So once you've kind of elicited what the physical complaints are, what you're worried about, really our physical exam can help us um, to determine the things that we're seeing that they perhaps may not be feeling. Um, I can tell you a lot of my patients with anorexia nervosa in particular say like, I feel fine. I can run a marathon. I feel fine. I don't understand why you guys are worried. Nothing is bothering me. And that's part of that, right? Lack of seriousness of really understanding the severity of, of the, the weight loss and the impact of the weight loss, but also the body is really good at protecting itself from feeling things that are uncomfortable. 
So the first part of the physical exam um, is your heart rate, your blood pressure, your temperature, your weight, high BMI, and your orthostatics. And these are the vital signs that I really rely on to help determine when patients move from stable to unstable and perhaps require levels of care or if we're moving to that level. And on the flip side, it can help me take a patient who has been really ill and as they progress and as they get they gain weight, we start to see those vital signs normalize. Um, and it's just another indicator that we're moving towards recovery. And then um, for our HENT exam, so you want to look at the dentition, particularly in patients you're worried about um, with self-induced vomiting, that rotted glad, uh, gland hypertrophy, and you're not going to see that in everyone, even some patients who purge after every meal, they will have normal parotid glands. Um, there can be conjunctival pallor from anemia, that brittle hair or hair loss. Cardiovascularly, right? Um, I, I mentioned the heart rate already, but bradycardia is a big thing. It scares us a lot. Um, edema, and those can be really those dependent areas, so sacral edema, peripheral edema in their lower extremities. A delayed cap refill, mitral valve prolapse is super common in eating disorder patients. And then this acrocyanosis um, reflecting that cardiovascular um, response to really being in a starving state. Looking at our GI system, we have those hypo or hyper bowel sounds and this palpable stool that can result from, um, from constipation. There can be a lot of discomfort during your exam. Musculoskeletal, uh, you get that muscle atrophy, that temporal wasting that can occur. And then with skin, some dry skin, cold extremities, the lanugo, poor wound healing, pressure ulcers, and Russell's sign, which refers to um, the abrasions that occur in people that use their fingers in order to, um, to have self-induced vomiting. One part of this is that you may see a patient who's had a lot of weight loss or, or is describing to you eating disorder cognitions and eating disorder behaviors and their physical exam may actually be normal. And it's gonna be differing depending on kind of what severity of malnutrition that they may um, be presenting with. All right, so what do I think about when I'm getting lab studies? And, and part of this is gonna be dependent on the patient that you're seeing some of those symptoms that they're complaining of, but I tend to get a baseline um, in all my patients that includes a comprehensive metabolic panel. And that's because I really wanna see liver. And we're gonna talk a little bit about liver in a bit. Magnesium and phosphorus, um, a CBC diff for the, for the reasons that I specified with anemia. We wanna check thyroid. We wanna check lipid panel, um, ESR uh, to help us with inflammatory markers. Nutritional studies, um, I get a vitamin D on everyone. And at this point, I expect everyone to be vitamin D deficient. And I'm I'm always sort of pleasantly surprised when I have a normal vitamin D. And that's not just in my eating disorder patients, that's in all of my patients. Um, and then zinc deficiency is really important and should be measured. And then there may be others that are clinic, uh, clinically indicated depending on what you're seeing. Um, and then others is going to sort of depend on the symptoms, right? So getting a cilia panel, looking at hormonal studies. So what is the testosterone level? What is the estrogen level? Um, a uric acid can tell us sort of what degree of catabolism our patients are in. And then an amylase lipase. I do a urinalysis on all my patients for all follow-ups and for um, their initial intake. And that can tell me a ton of information besides just if they're dehydrated or not, I can see if there's ketones in their urine, I can see their pH, right? If they have this high pH, then I start to think, oh, could there be self-induced vomiting that I'm seeing that's leading to that? Um, is there protein in their urine? Is there bilirubin in their urine? So all of these things can really help me um, figure out what they're presenting with, right? And if you see a patient who's had a large weight gain, you saw them last week and somehow they're six pounds up, is there your you know, is there your analysis showing that um, really dilute urine, and do you need to be worried about water loading? And then imaging again, I think baseline we always get an EKG, particularly if there seems to be um, some hypotension or some bradycardia showing us the cardiovascular impacts. And then DEXA scan, um, the 
evidence in the literature really recommends getting a DEXA scan if there's been amenorrhea for over six months. And more is being developed about um, when to do a DEXA scan in assigned male at birth because we don't have this easy clinical indicator like amenorrhea. So there's some stuff around, is there, if there's gonadal atrophy, um, should you get this DEXA to see, right, if their if um, hormonal impacts that are affecting their bone health. And then others really depend on the patient. So gastric emptying studies, looking at gastroparesis and delayed gastric emptying, an abdominal ultrasound or small bowel follow through, um, which is related to um, superior mesenteric artery syndrome, which I'm gonna talk about as well. Um, and then once I get my initial labs, you know, the frequency in which I repeat them really, again, depends on the patient. So if they were vastly normal and, you know, the patient starts to gain weight and is doing better, I don't necessarily repeat them. Um, if they were really abnormal and I'm worried about things, then I will repeat them more frequently. Or if there's been a clinical change, say that they were doing well and suddenly there was another drop in weight, I'm going to repeat those blood levels. So I'm going to get a little bit into the medical complications, and I feel like this topic could be, you know, a full day workshop um, because, again, malnutrition can impact every single organ system and in ways that are really wide and varying. Um, but I'm going to kind of briefly go through the things that I see mo most commonly and get worried about. So cardiovascular first, um, I've highlighted bradycardia because it scares me the most of anything. Um, and I've seen some incredibly, incredibly low heart rates, um, you know, I think down to the to the low 20s and perhaps high teens in patients that have lost a lot of weight, get really worried about arrhythmias and, um, and sudden cardiac death with bradycardia. And so that's like one of our hard and fast, we need to admit you if your heart rate's below 50. Um, and it's really sort of a combination of that starvation response, um, as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. We see a loss of cardiac muscle mass, thinning of walls that can really lead to decreased cardiac output, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and sudden death. Um, hypotension goes along with that. Um, I mentioned mitral valve prolapse is something that we see really, really commonly. Um, in patients, uh, particularly with the restrictive eating disorders. And then pericardial effusions can be related both to refeeding that we're gonna talk about later, but also just the patient's body's not being able to really process fluid the way that they're supposed to in that cardiac um, kind of sequelae that can lead to pericardial effusions and, and tamponade. And then we see Q2 prolongation um, as well on the EKG. The good news is that the vast majority of these resolve with weight gain, and I, uh, you're going to see this again and again and again. And I, I was like, should I keep saying weight gain? Yes, I'm going to keep saying weight gain because it's really the most important thing. All right, gastrointestinal. So again, this is super common, um, and it, and it's really tied to the degree of weight loss. So this delayed gastric emptying, this gastroparesis. The only thing that is going to um, improve this is increased nutrition and weight gain and a lot of my patients are really you know they say I'm, I have so much abdominal pain I have so much nausea I'm so bloated I can't eat anymore I can't do this and it's hard for me to say listen I'm sorry I know this sucks but the only way that this is going to get better is if you increase your nutrition and you gain weight um, tons of constipation and that can be really related to underuse of your intestinal system or, or some patients have overuse of laxatives there's reflux, um, both in increased nutrition and particularly in those patients that are having this delayed gastric emptying, but also patients that um, have some purging behaviors. We see hypercholesterolemia and transaminitis, and we don't have clear pathophysiology of how this happened, but a lot of it in terms of the transaminitis is we, we think that it's really due, due to kind of destruction of those liver, uh, those liver tissues. Um, and the hypercholesterolemia is, again, this almost response this, this um, sending of all those cholesterols over to the liver and they get broken down. And then we see those high levels. And again, this is treatable with weight gain. I wanted to highlight SMA syndrome. Um, it's different than of course the, the neurological musculoskeletal SMA syndrome. And is something that when I'm seeing patients that have had this high degree of weight loss that are really severely malnourished, 
I get worried about particularly when they're having a lot of abdominal distress and complaints and vomiting. What happens is there's this loss of this mesenteric fat pad that can cause the duodenal obstruction, right? So it's really this functional obstruction that is severe and you try and feed these patients in order to increase their nutritional status and have them gain weight. And there's, there's just nowhere for this food to go. So tons and tons of vomiting. The treatment for it again is weight gain. And um, one of the ways to do that is really more of a liquid diet. So do you need to just kind of rely on, on um, ensures or boosts, or is it so severe that you actually need to pass an NJ tube um, down in order to be able to bypass that obstruction and increase nutrition? I rely on my on my GI colleagues heavily um, to help guide me when I am suspicious. Fluid restriction and water loading. So um, there are this subset of patients that I see that are um, have restricted eating disorders who really just just will not drink any fluid, and part of that is that they like to be this dry weight. They don't like the the feeling of of having fluid in their bodies. It it kind of triggers their eating disorder and there's this all the smaller set that just don't want to take anything by mouth food or water and it can be incredibly dangerous and lead to severe dehydration and kidney injury in the eating disorder world we we like avoid iv fluids at all costs um but there's been a, a handful of time a handful of patients where the dehydration is just so severe that we need to go ahead and give them a, a fluid bolus and this can cause electrolyte abnormalities, right? You can get hyponatremia and hyperkalemia as a result um, of dehydration. And then water loading. So water loading um, is often used as a weight manipulation tactic, but can also be hunger control. And um, in patients that do water load, it can cause significant and life-threatening hyponatremia and, and fluid overload. And you would be surprised at the amount of water that patients can drink in a, in a short period of time. And of course, um, there are seizure risks related, particularly to that hyponatremia. Endocrine. Um, so I've broken these down into three kind of sets, but they're all interrelated. So reproductive, um, we know that mental dis, uh, dysfunction is, is related to the dysregulation of that HPO axis. Um, restrictive eating disorders often lead to oligo or amenorrhea. Treatment is weight gain. Binge eating disorder actually often is associated with early menarche or oligoamenorrhea, and there's this association with PCOS. The thyroid dysfunction that we often see is the sick thyroid syndrome, treatment is weight gain. Um, and then there's a lot um, of bone min mineral density changes. And I talk about this because it, this is one of those potentially irreversible um, sequelae, even if you weight restore your patients. You can have osteopenia, osteoporosis, and fracture risk. Um, and in young patients, particularly that are about to go through their, you know, growth spurt, um, there can be linear growth delays that are um, that are irreversible. Of particular note, um, combined oral contraceptives do not treat the bone mineral density. Um, however, there's ongoing kind of studies and changes about whether or not we go ahead and just do an estrogen replacement like we would do in in a, in a primary ovarian insufficiency um, in order to really help um, with that bone mineral density. So stay tuned. Nutritional deficiencies are so interesting and um, I've seen some, some things that I never thought I was gonna see like pellagra um, and scurvy as a result of eating disorders. So again, I highlight vitamin D deficiency is, the, is in the vast majority of patients. Um, and so most of them go on cholecalciferol we see calcium deficiencies, we see zinc deficiencies that can really um, cause delayed wound healing, um, as well as dry skin. Copper deficiencies, and copper is particularly interesting because copper deficiency actually mimics a lot of the other things that you're going to see in somebody who's just malnourished. Um, and so it takes a while, it costs a lot of money, but um, copper finding out the copper level can actually be helpful in relieving some symptoms that patients um, of course, there's iron deficiency, there's thiamine deficiency, and there's others, like I mentioned, pelaga with that um, with that niacin deficiency, vitamin C, and then folate B12. So um, I don't do the, I, I, you know, I do vitamin D and zinc on the vast majority of my patients, but the others kind of depend on, on what I'm seeing. 
Dermatologic findings, right? So that dry scaly skin that can be a result of both dehydration as well as um, zinc deficiencies. We see lanugo, uh, we see hair loss and, and bristleness. The acrocyanosis in this, this picture here uh, of really that bluing um, of, the, of the extremities. In addition to levator reticularis, we see petechiae, particularly in patients that have bone marrow suppression um, and then wound healing problems. And I put that picture, this is the Russell sign um, right here on the right of really those patients that you're seeing with bulimia nervous or purging in particular. And then the psychological psychiatric. So there are high rates of co-occurring psychiatric conditions in patients with eating disorders. And we see a lot of OCD, we see a lot of anxiety disorders and mood disorders. We see personality disorders, um, substance use, and then social withdrawal and isolation. And some of these may be, you know, predating the eating disorders. Some of them may be co-occurring and some of them really may be a result of the, the malnutrition as a result. Um, and we recommend weight gain in really to help us determine is this something that is ex existing um, with the eating disorder and not because of it. And again, I highlight suicide as one of the leading causes of death in patients with anorexia. So doing really good screening each and every time you see them is of utmost importance. Malnourished brains are depressed and anxious brains. Um, and a lot of this is due to the disruption of serotonin production, right? So if you get malnourished enough, your brain just doesn't, just doesn't produce serotonin. So a lot of the treatments that we would normally use, SSRIs, for example, just don't work until you get that patient to a higher weight, the weight gain is essential. All right, I wanna talk about pillars of eating disorder treatment and then um, finish up with some resources. So remission and full recovery is possible, it's achievable, patients can and do get better physically, cognitively, developmentally, emotionally. You see patients go on and thrive and go to college and live their best lives. This is what drives us to do what we do. Um, early intervention has the best chance of early and sustained remission um, and early intervention and weight restoration have the best chance of reversing that medical care. This is our levels of care, right? And I, I like the way that it's a pyramid because I, I think about right up at the top, we have inpatient, that's our highest level of care. And then we move down, um, outpatient being at the bottom. Um, and it's also representative that the vast majority of our patients are gonna be an outpatient, right? It's only the small subset that we're gonna require these higher levels. That outpatient care really is essential to have a multidisciplinary team. So that's the PCP, that's adolescent medicine, um, nutrition, social work, and then psychology and psychiatry. And psychology and psychiatry, in my opinion, are the most important piece of this because that's where, we, where the recovery happens. We can increase their weight, we can weight restore, but that change of, um, of thought and cognition in addition to how families um, function is so vital. Focus on early weight restoration. So that first month post-diagnosis is critical for length of recovery. The faster you weight restore, the, the more likely your patients are to recover and the less li likely it's gonna take a long time. And those regular visits, particularly early on, fo focus on nutrition goals. So getting three meals and two to three snacks. Those weight and vital sign checks. I always get a post-void gowned weight. 24 hour food recalls. What's your activity level? What's your mental health care? What's your reproductive sexual health care? What are your physical symptoms? And do we need to talk about labs? Um, I'm not going to talk about this slide because um, it's super busy, but it's basically the, um, the criteria for admission um, for medical instability as a result of malnutrition. And this is really um, something that can be found. Uh, the SAM guidelines uh, is a great resource for that. Um, and uh, and again, it's a guideline, so this isn't a hard and fast rule, except for a few things, um, but it helps us guide when patients need to be admitted. For us, our goals of admission are really that early weight restoration. So high calorie um, time and observed meals and snacks that are determined by our, our RD and the medical team. And where we provide food on trays. If you don't eat that, you can get um, a boost or an Ensure or um, last resort, an NG tube. 
We do weights and vitals, daily labs and bed rest. And then our psychology and psychiatry um, colleagues that help us with diagnostic clarity and recommendations for DISPO, in addition to those risk and safety assessments. And then a lot of parental education because they're gonna be the ones um, carrying things on when they go home. One thing that's super important that I highlight is nutrition is not negotiable. You have to get the food, the calories that we're prescribing to you. Food is medicine us it's a prescription quickly on refeeding um this is something that we see in the hospital as we increase nutrition um and it's really the body is shifting from that catabolism state to ana uh, anabolism and you see that intracellular um shifting of our electrolytes and drops extracellularly that can lead to electrolyte um significant electrolyte abnormalities and, and possible for dangerous fluid shifts in addition to cardiac arrhythmias um, the more the, the patient's weight has lost, the higher the risk of feeding syndrome. We negate this by giving first snack prophylactically and thiamine um, when they're first admitted to us. Okay, just lastly some resources. Um, this is us eating disorder program at Montefiore. Um, we are excited to take care of your patients. We work with, with PCPs. The PCP is what I consider the quarterback of the team. Um, if you have patients that you think should be followed with us, I have highlighted that number there. Um, please have the families call us and, and Alicia does a phone screen. We have three clinical sites that we can see patients at um, and we're, we are happy and excited to work with you. Additional resources. I love this. This is the purple book. This is really a really good guide to medical care that's um, for free and it's by the Academy of Eating Disorders. You can just go on that website and look it up. Um, as well as uh, these other websites that are very helpful. And then lastly, just quickly, because I want questions, I, there's, I think you guys have access to this, um, but if not, we can all send it on. These are just some things that I give to my patients. So that's for general anorexia. We have some stuff for binge eating disorder, and then we have stuff for arthritis. Pulse VOP, I don't need to highlight this. Early intervention, weight restoration, multidisciplinary teams, um, and eating disorders can be scary, but they are treatable. My references. So thank you. And I wanted to make sure to leave time for questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Richards. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I have a question. Yeah. How has the pandemic affected the numbers and the types of different, various types of uh, eating disorders that you're caring for right now? It's skyrocketed. Um, and I don't have numbers for you, so I can't give you specific numbers. But, um, you know, for example, where I was at for fellowship, we went from an average census of four to an average census of around 10 to 12 that were admitted to our inpatient service. Um, and our wait list just to do outpatient, you know, was about eight, 80 patients big at any time. Um, so there's just been a huge increase in, in incidence and prevalence, in addition to a huge increase in patients that are being identified early and therefore referred for care. So where that number exactly is, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's definitely higher. And I would say that the vast number of patients are being diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, and there's a huge amount of them that are atypical, that are falling in that atypical. Dr. Schulte, I could just tell you the phone calls that we um, have gotten for care from 2020 to 2021, I think we probably got at at least a hundred more phone calls from mm. from one year to the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat. During my PEDS training, I cared for a nine year old with anorexia nervosa. What's the youngest age you have diagnosed? Um, seven, and it was really classic. It was it was a family um, who there was just an incredible genetic load. Uh, you know, the the mom had had anorexia, the grandma had anorexia, um, a sibling had anorexia, and it was a it was an eight-year-old boy who, who was diagnosed. 
and it's really difficult it's it's really difficult because the you know the developmental stages are are, are so wildly different and there's um just our ability to kind of get insight and and buy in is is really hard Great, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat. Can you comment on orthorexia and differences in treatment from other restrictive disorders? Yeah, I, so I the, the orthorexia thing is really interesting. This focus on healthy eating and and um, ends up leading essentially to the same thing, right? It's calorie restriction, weight loss, malnutrition, and you end up in the same position that other patients are. So. I, my approach is what I would do with any other patient, which is your body is in an incredible energy deficit. You are starving. And right now, what's healthy for you is more calories. And so there's a number of ways that you can do that. But the, the healthiest food for you right now is the food that has, has higher calorie density. Well, thanks to you both. There's uh, a number of comments. Oh, here's another question. How long do you follow up kids to feel reassured that they are cured? Well, this is a great question. And I think um, it's it's hard, right? And I, And this is a different question, the therapy piece to the medical piece. And so um, the, the medical piece is really, you know, once you get them back to their growth trajectory, depending on the age, there's going to be um, more growth that should happen naturally, right? Young people should be gaining weight into their 20s. So if you tell them that their weight goal is is this, and then they hit it, but they're still 15 years old, right? You They don't think that they have to gain any more weight. So what we often do is get them to weight restoration. I like to see six months where they're maintaining along their curve. And then you know, it's going to be regular follow up. And does that have to be with me? No, it can be with the pediatrician. And just to say is, are we seeing that you're maintaining your 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 weight along your growth curve? Are you continuing to thrive? Are there anything else that's coming up? So it's variable. But, um, you know, the, these patients are at risk of redeveloping, relapsing. And so having close follow up, either with adolescent medicine or, or with um, primary care is just awesome. And I saw that Bernadette, Dr. Fasina, you said, is Ozempic making your job more complicated? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if you can um, make ha have a comment on that based on the remaining minute uh, in your session today. What are your thoughts about Ozempic? Yeah, I think um, Ozempic is really a complicated drug because um, it essentially, you know, takes away your appetite and um, it, it's one of those medications that you're on it or you're, you know, you're, especially with children, you're supposed to stay on it for a long term. And it completely changes people's relationship with food. And like I said earlier, if you're restricting and you're dieting, you're at higher risk of developing eating disorders. Wow. So it's well, scary for you in kids. Great. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you to our speakers and um, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.